We do have a clip coming up from Peter Duke. And when Peter Duke wants to find a clip, we talked about him. He'll use Clip Genie because he, he watches the show. But if he wanted to find this part, as he will this coming week, because he talked about me not talking about this thing I'm about to talk about in great detail. So I wanted to just set it there. That's coming up in this next media block. But first, we're going to go to legally armed America because, you know, that ninth shot has yet to be accounted for. We're 20 days in. The Secret Service didn't claim it. They didn't say crooks did it. They they would have said nine casings and been done. Why are they leaving the, the unknown shot hanging out there? Are they trying to create conspiracy theories? Who took the shot? Was that the professional? Like, let's, let's say this. Let's say you got a professional assassin and he's a maybe local cop who might have a gambling problem or something like that. And they can get the drop on them. Maybe some black man, whatever. They do that. It's a thing. Okay. It's gone on for a long time. So they got this person and they're supposed to do this job. When this, when this guy who's obviously been seen and witnessed and range finder, when that guy starts shooting, you take your one shot and you do the deed. People have second thoughts. People get in the middle of something. Maybe he just fired the shot into the air and say like, oh, I missed because it hasn't been accounted for. Did somebody get cold feet? Did someone blow the shot? Because like if you were close, you probably would have hit somebody else and we would have seen another injury that's not accounted for with the number of rounds. So it's an interesting little enigma. Is it part of the wag the dog script? Or is this something that has yet to be like, maybe one of those ESU guys took a shot and is embarrassed or lied to his, I don't know. But we haven't heard it yet and we're 20 days in and one of the guys is dead. So who's covering up this ninth shot? The Secret Service said 15.5 seconds, their guy put him down. Did someone shoot and wound him? Is that why the shots stopped after the ninth shot for like eight seconds before he gets put down? What happens there? We don't know yet. So we're going to have to keep looking with the intent to understand. And we're going to start by what what's, what do other smart people surveying the area, what do they see? Let's go to Legally Arm America. And then we're going to go to Peter Duke and George Webb for the first three, 13 minutes, first 13 minutes of their episode, Alas, Poor Yurik, which of course is a Macbeth reference that goes back to, uh, you know, Macbeth lamenting the death of the, you know, his d jester teacher character, Yurik. Alas, poor Yurik. I knew thee well. That, that whole sort of thing made it into a Peter Duke title. And that just tells you Peter Duke's working with an above average intelligence set to just make titles that you know immortalize Macbeth in maybe ways that we have yet to calculate so we'll learn about Yurik and the van with the Arizona plates and stuff like that uh let's go first to legally armed America Hey there, friends. Thank you for joining me for another Legally Owned America video. I'm, of course, Paul Glasgow. Before I get started, if there's somebody out there who is a subscriber of this channel and also you're signed up for my newsletter, if your name is Mariah, check your email. Remember, we had a giveaway where we we're giving away this Gideon Optic Rock a couple weeks ago, and it was Judge specifically it. to a person who belonged to the for the Way email and crooks you get 10 percent i want to tell them guys you you know we can see you right that's good perfect example is another is it ignoring or is it deterring you make the decision we know that there were 10 rounds fired during the entire volley of shots now I'm not saying in that statement who fired what. I'm telling you, 10 rounds were fired. I don't know if it was 10 people, one person, two people, three people, or four people. But 10 rounds were definitely fired. In fact, this most recent video from the guy Dave from last week clearly proves that. You hear the first three, then you hear the next five in pretty rapid succession, then you hear number nine, and then after a pretty decent pause, you hear the last 10th shot.
I'm going to play it one more time. So would you agree there were 10? Okay, apparently the Secret Service Director, Mr. Rowe, doesn't agree with us. Check this out. At 6.11 p.m., the assailant's first volley of three shots was fired. And within three seconds, the former president's detail rushed the stage and covered former President Trump, shielding him with their own bodies. The four through eight shots took place over the next several seconds. 15 and a half seconds after the assailant's first shot, a Secret Service counter sniper fired a single round that neutralized the assailant. So why would they lie about this? You know they have more information than what we do. We're looking at the most simple, basic stuff from people who shot with a freaking cell phone. And we can determine that. In fact, all these other sound analysis, Mike Adams, uh, Chris Martinson, they've all shown in much greater detail than I do and with a lot more specificity and a lot more intelligence how many rounds were fired. In fact, they're telling you how far away they were, what if, if it was more than one gun, because the report's different. They're giving you all this additional information, but the one thing we all agree on, and we all know, everybody except the Secret Service, is that there were 10 shots fired, they still claim nine. I've said it before, if you have nothing to hide, why lie about it? Why not tell the truth? No, it, it, this is not a guess that there were 10 shots fired. This is an absolute fact, especially with the new video that we saw. So, why act like that shot in between there is not there? And the shot they're talking about is the nine shot because they're saying the first three, boom, 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 were crooks, and then they're saying the next five, bop, 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 that all those were crooks as well. I'm not saying that. That's what they're saying. So they automatically carve out that first eight, and then they say, what, 10 or 11 seconds later that the kill shot was taken? Okay, well, maybe it was. That last and final shot likely was the kill shot that ended the whole show. But that's not shot number nine. How can they not hear this shot? I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on that because I am completely perplexed and do not understand why they're either ignoring that shot or what makes them think that's not a shot or why they're not claiming that shot? Is it because they claim they have eight rounds of brass on top of the roof and maybe they don't want to admit that somebody missed? Somebody. I'm not saying who and I'm not saying who they were firing at. But do they not want to admit that another person fired a shot and that that shot did not hit anybody? I'm also curious where these rounds went. Um, let's be honest here. They're talking about they've got the brass, right? Whatever. But these rounds went somewhere. We're not talking about caliber of weapon other than what they claim crook shot. Okay, so those rounds went somewhere. If those eight rounds were in fact from crooks, show me where they hit or show me who they hit and where that person was and show me in your hand the projectiles. I get that if they hit something super hard like a railing or something iron or whatever that they could have just uh, split apart. I get that. I mean, that's possible with the amount of velocity and the tumbling and all that good stuff. But you got projectiles somewhere. And another thing, if eight rounds came from crooks, they're saying that one Nick Trump's ear, uh, Corey Compatori, let me get his name right, was hit and the two other gentlemen were hit. So at the most, four people. That means that there were four rounds that did not hit anybody. Where did they go? Who did they hit? What did they hit? If they didn't hit anybody, they should have gone into the bleachers. We should be able to see that mark, right? I haven't seen any evidence of anything hitting the bleachers. It should be in the dirt, right? 
You think they just left that there? They didn't just leave that there. <laughs> if these rounds went into the soil, they got those rounds out. But what about the ones that went supposedly towards crooks? We've heard the argument that his head should not be intact as it is now. But not only that, if two shots went back that direction, and that's what some of the reports are. Some of the reports are that, that nice shot, not the one they're claiming number nine, our claim of number nine, that that is a missed shot from somebody. Somebody, some people have said the Pennsylvania secret, uh, excuse me, uh, counter snipers, and some people have claimed other counter snipers, but not Secret Service. And then number 10 is what we're going to assume was the counter sniper from Secret Service. Where'd those rounds go? I recently dug up some drone footage from a guy called, uh, his channel's name is The Spa Guy. Really good drone footage, really good drone footage. In fact, I'll get more about where the rounds might have landed here in a second. This guy took a drone after everything and he showed the path of what Crooks likely took, pointing out where his bicycle was parked, where he likely got up on top of the roof. We keep hearing a bunch of the arguments. Supposedly there's conspiracy about a ladder. After seeing this guy, the spa guy's video, I don't think there's much conspiracy about the ladder. I think he's right on the money. He actually shows that he likely climbed on top of this, what, three or four foot tall? air conditioning unit and then climb from there on top of this little building, this little shed right next to the building. And then from the shed, he climbed up on top of the roof. From there, he had a clear path of just jumping up and down on various surfaces to get all the way to the AGR building facing Trump where allegedly the shots were fired from. So it seems pretty reasonable to me that again, this is a spa guy's video, great video by the way. And it does, to me, show a very reasonable path that was more than likely taken by crooks. Now, the question I have is, where did these rounds go? They should have landed behind crooks, right? If all they could see is, is his head, maybe they hit one of the shots might have hit that ridge, the one that missed. I don't see any bullet holes in the roof. I don't see any bullet holes in the neighboring roof. And I haven't seen anything in the ridge because that would be a very obvious hole in that ridge. It wouldn't be something that skimmed off that ridge. It would be a hole through it. And I've not seen any of that. So my point is, where are the rounds? Where did every single round, where did 10 rounds go? I think these people owe it to us because they have created enough gray space and enough gray areas to where we don't trust them. No one trusts the Secret Service right now. Not many people trust the FBI, and that trust is waning by the moment, the more lies and the more cover-ups that come out about the FBI. So they created this sense of, you're lying to me, right? They did that. We didn't do that. We didn't set out to do this. We didn't create these, these memos internally that say that white people who, uh, <laughs> who celebrate Jesus and have guns are the greatest threat to America. We didn't create that narrative. They did. So with all these lies that continue to come out by them and all this rhetoric that they're trying to do as far as carrying the Democrats' water, we sit back and we don't trust them. So by doing that, they have created this massive smoke screen that we look at and go, I'm not buying it. You're lying to me. I feel like they owe it to us. These congressmen, senators out there that seem to be the only ones that can even get a remote answer, not a straight answer, even a remote answer from these people should be asking that. Where is shot number 10? That's all I want to know at this point, right? Because you've lied about all the other questions that we've asked, but we have absolute proof that there was a 10th shot fired. Number nine is the one they are not accounting for. And I wanna know why. I want someone to listen to that audio and look me in the eye and go, that wasn't a gunshot, right? Make them listen to the same audio we are listening to and listen to them all the way through and then tell me you did not hear a gunshot at number nine. I will call them a damn liar to their face because I know damn well that is a gunshot. And they are doing nothing but creating more question marks whenever they lie about the super duper obvious. And I will say this, these people are notorious for diversionary tactics. Are they creating this controversy about shot number nine and some of the other things that they won't answer straight? 
because they're trying to distract us from something else. They're known for doing this. Watch out what the left hand is doing right now because this looks like a purposeful attempt at them to create controversy where there's really not any. God save the queen, man. I'm sorry, I thought this was America. And we're back. How you doing, George? Great, Peter. How about yourself? I'm pleased as punch to be here. And I just wanted to start off the show by letting everyone know that neither one of us have any suicidal thoughts and that we're never going to go sit in a garage with the doors closed and the engine running. Uh, because this is the time, this is the season after the JFK assassination when people who were starting to un uncover inconvenient facts just mysteriously started dying. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, and uh, we're, well, I don't know what to say after that, but we had a couple of people do that uh, when I was in Pittsburgh, so. Um, oh, so, really? Well, let's yeah. talk about that for a sec, yeah. Well, there was this guy in Massachusetts, and then there was this uh, group in, um, in Michigan, uh, two different incidents in Michigan that have happened. And, you know, they say if you like staying alive, it's not a direct threat, I'm going to kill you. It's like if you like living, if you like remaining alive, that's kind of like a death threat, you know. And again, right. I don't take it too seriously because there's been a lot of these things. But um, I do think it's a way of stifling free speech. Well, yeah, it's, it definitely creates a, a situation where a lot of people like you and me, we, we might start talking in code or uh, uh, kind of uh, what Michael Hoffman, I would think, refers to as twilight language, where like if you're on, if you're in the if you're in the know that you'll understand what we're talking about. Otherwise, maybe not. Yeah, and I think this is a really uh, a volatile time after the assassination because, um, you know, it's, it's kind of this generation's JFK and it's kind of this visceral thing that was a scene live, CNN carried it live. So it was different than the Zapruder film, which is 14 years later. Um, it's, you know, because of the impact. Um, and then it was a lot of the things that happened in the uh, Kennedy assassination, JFK, didn't happen in this one. They displayed the gun within a couple of hours. Um, they had given a whole background sketch, a personality sketch and resume of Lee Harvey Oswald and sent it all over the world. Yeah, didn't, didn't they release that into, uh, wasn't it released in Australia, like before the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> before any, any even know, anyone even knew in the United States that it had happened? In Antarctica, they, uh, with uh, Fletcher Prouty, they know that it happened before it happened. So, yeah, this is different. You know, they just came out with a gun yesterday. Uh, the acoustic evidence that was in Dealey Plaza with the two shooters, if you remember, didn't come out until the House Committee on Assassinations, like 25 years later. The acoustic evidence here with two shooters was within days. Um, we had the three tramps. Remember the three tramps um, in walking? Right. Uh, we had the video of the two tramps tramping a firing line, a, a, a sniper firing line, one of them being the uh, Tony guy, the... the you know, the sheriff of Butler County, and he's trailing 50 yards behind crooks. You know, they seem to be... Or, or somebody who looked like crooks. Well, you know, somebody looked like crooks, but, but the other thing is crooks looks like he's being harbored by Tony by Tony Guy. Uh, he's seen at 426, and then the sniper says, I'm out 100 minutes before Trump takes stage. And then he goes in, in the same building as Tony Crooks in the command center. So it looks like Tony Crooks... Or, excuse me, Tony Guy is the one, Sheriff Tony Guy is the one harboring crooks until he can go out at the appropriate time until Trump, Trump takes the stage. And they they still get that wrong. They set him up at 538 and, and Trump doesn't come out till 611 or 608 or something like that. So 20 minutes too early. So a lot of things went wrong here. But I think the one thing that uh, has already come out is Trump's already accused the FBI of uh, doing it. You know, he's already said, you did it. You know, this isn't one of those things where you had to come up with the word conspiracy theory, you know, a year later when you didn't agree with the Warren Commission, you know, and, and Alan Dulles had to remember a word. It's right out there now. Trump's saying, hey, you tried to kill me. Right. And I, I, I think it's 
really interesting right now, too, because, uh, you know, it, I don't know if you got a chance to read my Russia, Russia, Russia article that I published last week. Yeah. Um, it's on my Buy Me a Coffee. I And, it, you know, I'd like to hear in the comments uh, what people think. I'm thinking about bailing on Buy Me a Coffee and just uh, uh, doing what you're doing, George, and moving it over to Substack, because Buy Me a Coffee just, uh, it doesn't have uh, some of the stuff that I need uh, to to do, and, and people have been having problems, uh, uh, you know, basically sending me money on, on uh, Buy Me a Coffee, so uh, I, I've got... I've got issues. We're going to figure figure those things out. But um, in the article uh, that I wrote, uh, I was talking about how um, you know my thesis is that uh, the powers that be, the people who are unnamed, the uh, the people who uh, E. Michael Jones and uh, uh, Stu Peters uh, claim are the quote unquote Jews uh, uh, who control the world, are not. Are, are, that's not actually what's going on. The the world is controlled by Atlanticists. And one of the things that the Atlanticists want is that they want the United States government to change. And fundamentally, they want the First Amendment and the Second Amendment to disappear because it gets in the way of their agenda, their global domination agenda. They have to be able to control the government of the United States. So it is in their best interest for Americans to think that they have a government that does not function. Now, the fact that it doesn't function is is one thing. The psychological warfare component of that is another. And uh, the, the idea that uh, we have a government that doesn't work and that something needs to change uh, is an idea that is right in line with what the Atlanticists want. So in as much as people... Um, who are wanna, who want to fight the deep quote unquote deep state? Uh, 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 are their their thoughts are well placed? The agency is not well placed, meaning that the, the FBI has a boss, and the FBI the in the in the Constitution the FBI's boss is the executive branch, but it actually stops before it hits the president, and it stops at the National Security Council, and the National Security Council, for all intents and purposes, is answerable to the Atlanticists, not to the president, and um, and that's where we have to. Uh, be very careful now, I think, when, in the way that we think about things and the way that we look at all of the different players and who they are answerable to. So, for example, Christopher Ray, it's only on this show, and it's only from us that you'll ever hear that Christopher Ray's uh, father was, is, is today a lifelong member, like over 50 years, of the Council on Foreign Relations. Okay, why is that important? Because the Council on Foreign Relations are the people that call the shots. It's what Hillary Clinton refers to as the mothership. And it was created in 1919 after the failure of the Senate to pass the Treaty of Versailles, to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, uh, where the globalists really thought that they were going to take control of the United States. They took control of the United States financially in 1913. And then they thought that they were going to be able to take control of the government of the United States in 1919 with the Treaty of Versailles. And they didn't get that. So they had to create the Council on Foreign Relations. And so Christopher Wray is uh, you know, multi-generational Atlanticist. He doesn't answer to the executive branch. If he answers to anybody, he's answering to the National Security Council. And you know, he, was at, he was at the World Economic Forum uh, in 2023. Uh, so we have to be really careful when we talk about deep state because I think that I think that the deep state is the state of the world. I don't think it's the state of the United States. I think there's a deep state, but there is a deep state in France and there's a deep state in Great Britain and there's a deep state in Russia and it's all the same deep state. <laughs> well, I would agree with you. The Atlantic Council specifically was added to bring in the sort of hoi polloi from Europe. Uh, and, and, and I understand what the Dick Cheney's of the world think. You know, they think, well, energy is war, war is energy. Council on Foreign Relations, Dick Cheney. Right. Yeah. And, and if we don't control energy in all its forms, and then we're not going to be ready for war. And most people don't think about energy until it gets cold, or they don't think about energy until it gets hot. Uh, or they don't think about energy until they have to go somewhere. So we have to be the ones, the high priests of energy, 
And so we have to be thinking about war all the time to make sure the energy is, is there. And therefore, we have to do mass formation psychosis and all these other false flags because the people are too stupid. And they really believe that. We have to sometimes kill uh, political opponents. We have to have sanctions. I, I have a substack out called the Cheney Sanction. And that's just the way it is because they don't, you know, you can't leave people to think about energy for themselves. And the CFR is that, and, and the Atlantic Council is that. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that that's the power base. So we need to, um, and just jumping back to Ray for a second, like, I would expect Richard Grove to be talking about how Ray's father is in the Council on Foreign Relations. He hasn't, I, I think, he, Richard's a good guy. I, I think he probably just hasn't connected those dots yet. Just, likewise, James Corbett. Um, camera. What? My camera. It looks like your camera was unplugged. Yeah, Peter had a camera problem, but he got it fixed. <laughs> and he's right. I had not talked about it yet. We could use Clip Genie to have certainty if I had talked about it yet. But I have not. But I will. Even though we're rolling up on 4 a.m. on Monday morning, starting this show, 9.30 Sunday night. I'm going to go into a little deep dive with uh, the history blueprint. Now, I started this model in 2008. It currently has more than 10,000 thoughts. Christopher Ray would be a thought in the brain. 50,000 connections, supporting documents, links, etc. All that sort of thing is part of the history blueprint. So let's go to Christopher Ray. By the way, Grand Theft World members, you have access. All right, Christopher Ray, current FBI director. He worked under Mueller. He worked under Chertoff. He worked under Comey. So he had a big comeuppance. On his way up, he's part of King and Spalding. Let's check that out real quick. Let's go over here to the browser, follow it. Uh, North America, White Shoe Law Firm. Interesting, interesting. A lot of CIA, OSS, uh, Foreign Agents Registry, some Saudi, some atomic stuff. Uh, AC, uh, Donald, wait, wait, what? The firm advises Donald Trump's real estate empire. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Let's just hold that thought for a second. Let's go back to the history blueprint, a.k.a. my brain model. And let's go up to see who this character's dad was, because as Peter mentioned, Cecil A. Ray Jr. is the father of the current FBI director. He married Gilda Gates. Here's a New York Times article on that. Uh, and Cecil Ray Council on Foreign Relations, I'm going to move that to an affirmative because it has now been verified, not just speculated. Now, let me show you part of my problem. When I went over, first off, I was watching Peter's episode and I heard my name and I thought, yeah, I didn't do any research into Christopher Ray, really. And let's let's go over here. I, I, I need to know who his dad is. So I'm going to type in, quote, Cecil A. Ray Jr. plus CFR. There's going to be one result on the internet. Oh, they removed it yesterday. Let me let me see if I got his name right. Maybe I got his name wrong. Let's I go back. I think you got that. you got the quotation marks in the beginning, not the end, and it might be glitch no, now. I got maybe. him. Cecil A. Ray Jr. Let's go. Oh back. no, never mind. Never mind. Okay, Wait. never mind. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah, I got. It, I got. It. Let's see. Let's go back here. Anyway, yesterday when I did this, there was one result and it went to some like conspiracy thing that got handed out at somebody's church that said he was in the CFR and I wasn't able to verify it, but LD slid me some links and I did verify from the council on foreign relations. Let's go to, uh, let's see. There was a link, not just the Adirondack ties here. Oh, sorry. I forgot to switch screens for you. List of law clerks. He was a Supreme Court law clerk at one point. Council on Foreign Relations. Oh, uh, was it back here at Christopher Ray that I added those links? No. LD, can you bring up the uh, Council on Foreign Relations roster that shows membership of, of Cecil A. Ray? Yeah. But while you're doing that, I want to point out there's an ongoing long-term goal of uh, let's go at it like this. I'm going to type conquest, British conquest to recolonize America. That goes from 1781 to present. Part of that is the British infiltration of the U.S. intelligence community. Before we even had an, an intelligence community, the Century Club 
was the group that was mixed in the communists and the capitalists. This is like who's being talked about by Cecil Rhodes. I'm sorry, by Carol Quigley. They were the ones who were American International Corporation facilitating the infrastructure for the soon to be Soviet project, the soon to be communist China project. This is these are the movers and shakers who play on both sides. And there's a point to me showing you that Cecil A. Ray played both sides like this because the law firm that he worked for is called De Bois De Bois and Plimpton. Let's see what they do. Let's go over here to the browser because controversial. They did the Oxycontin. Yeah, okay. Guantanamo. Lindsay Lohan and Grand Theft Auto. It's not great. This isn't a video game. This is this isn't Grand Theft Auto. This is Grand Theft World, kids. Uh, they had something to do about that. But there was something here that was like they represented the anti-Trump people. So his son's firm handles Trump's real estate empire. And this firm, if I remember correctly, had something to do that was like anti-Trump, working both sides of the aisle, as it were. Let's see. I'm reading it backwards. I know that's always a problem when you read things backwards, but I thought, oh, wait, the firm assisted the Democratic Party in the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. So the firm of the current FBI director's dad did that. And then the firm of the current FBI director advises Donald Trump's real estate empire. That's what you call a conflict of interest. Pretty sure even at 4 a.m. in the morning, we can all recognize a conflict of interest there. That doesn't seem to bode well for the non-deep state arguments. But for the deep state argument, it kind of looks more like this. So the Voice and Plimpton, Council on Foreign Relations, Century Club. This is the Anglo-American establishment, Holy of Holies group right here. Phi Beta Kappa and Yale Law School, just like Christopher Ray and just like J.D. Vance. So this is the interesting little cul-de-sac we've come to. There's a lot more interesting information on these topics, but I have at least now scratched the surface to uh, edify Mr. Duke with his astute observations. And uh, well played calling me out, Peter. Thank you for doing it nicely. Yeah, shout out to Peter and George. You guys are crushing. Yeah, that was that was pretty interesting. I also liked his Atlanticist description of the ruling power infrastructure. So we're all on the same page with that. And uh, LDI, I didn't see the rest of that episode. Did they get to identifying Yurik and his potential involvement? I I didn't get too far into that myself, but I heard that. And so I went looking for what I could find about Cecil Ray. I did go to the CFR.org forward slash membership forward slash roster and uh, keyword search. There's Cecil Ray. So there was a, there is a Cecil Ray on the roster of the Council on Foreign Relations. No, I I agree. And you found that part, and then I found what history blueprint. Let's see, uh, right here, Cecil Ray. If you bring up this link, which goes over here to the browser, here he is. Don't call the phone number. We're not trying to dox anybody. He's retired. But Yale Law School and Vanderbilt, right? So his son went to Vanderbilt and Yale Law School. J.D. Vance also went to Yale Law School. There's a lot of East India Company, Yale Law School, Yale University tonight in this Anglo-American establishment type of story. He is a member of the Bar of New York. Um, read full biography. This is not the good biography. So now, if I go to this other one that I found, it does say uh, he's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So now you have Council on Foreign Relations and his law firm saying he's CFR. And CFR, also a firm from a CFR guy, owned the AGR building. Right? We looked that up all a couple weeks ago because everyone said it's BlackRock and there is BlackRock involved. But the AGR, AGR building, the firm that owns it, it's heavy duty CFR, and we might find he's a Century Club guy. What was his name? Baker or Rice? His name was Rice a couple weeks ago. James Rice. Uh, Scott, can you use Clip Genie and find yeah, James Rice? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep. All right. You. And then I want to find this other uh, bio for Cecil Ray. 
because I know that I had more than one reference. Oh, here it is right here. I have a, I have a thought on it and then it goes to this browser. Now we can see a little bit deeper because <clears throat> uh, you went university of Virginia, Vanderbilt, Yale university, which Yale law. He worked at Devo Du Bois and Plimpton. All right. We got that part. Phi beta Kappa. You know, Phi Beta Kappa, if we went back to the history blueprint for a second, just for a second, and we went to Cecil Ray and we went to Phi Beta Kappa, there's a lot of people, Elliot Spitzer, like people involved in 9-11, Phi Beta Kappa, Ro Rhodes Scholar, Rhodes Scholar, Fulbright, Rockefeller, there's Jeb Bush, John Foster Dulles. There's a lot, of, like this is a fraternity that keeps on fraternity -ing. Another Rhodes Scholar, Woolsey, McNamara, Rubin, Salmon Chase. Teddy wrote like Webster Tarpley. There's a whole bunch of Phi Beta Kappa running around. You better keep an eye on the smart, smart people because that's the genius fraternity. You see what I'm saying here? Skull and Bones. You know, they might be running circles. Dave Chappelle's mom, bro, right here. I'm just saying, really smart people might be running stuff. I'm not making any accusations whatsoever. I'm just saying. There's a lot of Rhodes Scholars. This guy wrote uh, the uh, P the catastrophic terrorism document foreshadowing 9-11. Another Rhodes Scholar. Later became Secretary of Defense. Here's the document. Here's the evidence. This is the predecessor to the PNAC. Now, if you have a six-hour memory and attention span, and you can remember what I said about PNAC six hours ago, start connecting the dots and be more assertive, please. Because Project for a New American Century might be something like the Century Club, and it might be part of this British conquest to recolonize America and take away freedom for individuals on this planet forever. Might want to know something about it. Anyway, uh, the Clip Genie, did it have a result, Scott? Yeah, I put it in the production chat, but Mr. basically I just rice, typed in rice. rice. Yeah, so there's two links there. There's the GTW. Okay. I just typed in Rice because, right, yeah. yeah, Joseph Rice third. Joseph, Joseph Rice. Rice and that's yeah. Clayton Dubillier, right, that owned AGR. So let me just type in Clayton uh, Dubillier. I don't know. Wiki. There it is. This, these are the, this is the place that owned the AGR building, right? And then when you get into the history, Joseph Rice, Rice Baby, if you're not tired of my vanilla ice at this point in the morning, uh, oldest private equity firm in the world, one of the oldest. And where's Sullivan and Cromwell? This is the firm that staffed the OSS and the CIA. So now you have CFR, because he's a member of the CFR right here, Brookings Institution, right? Doesn't say century. That's what I was looking for. But there's like some heavy overlaps. CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, Sullivan and Cromwell, intelligence agencies, and the people who investigate them. So if there's this CFR firm run by Joseph Rice, that's du, uh, Clayton Dubillier, and there was the other one that uh, Chris Devoy, De Bois and Plimpton, and then Christopher Ray's firm, which was the king in, I don't know, it's too late. It's too early in the morning for me to remember all the law firm names, but they're on the record there. We heard them tonight. You know, the thing, man. Yeah. Come on, Jack. Come on, Jack. <laughs> Can't be perfect. This ain't Fox news. Mm -hmm. uh, also just an idea for you, Scott. I think yeah. you should use clip genie to montage all the times I talked about clip genie and then use that for your marketing. There you go. Amazing. Because as a graduate of autonomy, I continue to mentor even though you're a graduate. Just wanted to offer Beautiful. That. I love it. That's the beauty of autonomy. It's just the gift that keeps on giving, man. Like for real. Everyone's doing some kind of self-help these days. And you can find a million self-help courses out there. Most other courses out there are hosting lectures. They're hosting videos. They're maybe even doing Q&As. And these are great starting points to encourage learning. But at Autonomy, we believe that hands-on practice is the best way to really lock in what we're learning. There's no better way to gain confidence and mastery than through action. After each lecture, we practice the concepts we've learned with other students, giving and receiving feedback in a non-judgmental environment. 
The result is mastery of concepts like entrepreneurship, ethical sales, and self-reliance in an environment that directly translates to the real world. Plus, you make connections with other like-minded individuals who are learning right alongside you, and you have a lifetime membership in the community. The Autonomy Course with Richard Grove equips you with confidence, competence, and courage in a world filled with confusion and noise. You can learn more at getautonomy.info. We'll see you there. What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective, it's useful, it's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.